Testing one. Testing. My call sign is Golf Zero, Foxtrot Uniform Whiskey. That's the amateur radio call sign for those who are not uh, amateur radio in the room tonight. And I'm a board member of the Radio Society of Great Britain. And I've also been the, uh, the project director for putting on what's called Youngsters on the Air. Uh, and that's why we're here at, uh, at Gilwell Park this week. Um, the young members of our youth committee, um, Mike, who you just met, uh, is the chairman of that committee, have been working for well over two years on this project, so it's nice to see all those plans and ideas finally coming to fruition. Um, and it's fantastic, best of all, to see all the young people from 26 different countries here today. So uh, well done for, for making the trip, and uh, you're all very welcome to the UK. Um, We'd also like to thank all our supporters. We've had superb support from 
amateur radio clubs, from individual radio amateurs, from the industry, and we could not have done this without all that help. So could you give us a, a round of applause for all those people who've helped to do this? And also, another person that we couldn't have done this without is Lisa Leenders, uh, who's come all the way from Netherlands. Where is she? And uh, Lisa has the, uh, the role of being what we call the Region 1 Youth Coordinator. And Region 1 is the whole of Europe and the whole of Africa. So, in effect, Lisa looks after young people in a very large area, not just uh, uh, one country. So, uh, so well done, Lisa. Um, and I'd like to hand the microphone over to Lisa, who's going to tell you a little bit more about her work. Yes, uh, thank you, Steve. First of all, I'm uh, very happy to see so many uh, young people here and also uh, the scouts. Um, I would like to say this is going to be a very special moment that we are going to talk to an astronaut uh, live in the air. So uh, I think it's a bit of a one of a life chance. So it's uh, really cool to see uh, you all of here. So we are very happy this year to have the Young Sunny Air program here uh, in the UK, hosted by the RSGB. Um, YOTA is a youth program by IRU, like Steve already told. We have uh, some several activities we do over the year. And one of our main things is uh, the yearly youth uh, event here, in, uh, which is now in the UK, it's already the seventh edition. And what we do, we try to promote amateur radio amongst youngsters. And next to this, we also try to organize all kinds of uh, youth activities. And basically, the name says it already, we try to get more youngsters on the air. So if you're interested to get more information, please go to the website, uh, where you can find a lot of information and pictures. And also for the scouts, uh, it's also interesting for you. We do many activities. Have a look and uh, enjoy tonight. Lisa, thank you very much. So my name's Mike Jones. My radio call sign's 2E0MLJ. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my journey in amateur radio and how I got from looking to a radio in the side of a classroom in school um, to come in here and organising Yota 2017. So my journey first started back in 2011 when I went to Callington Secondary School and was doing physics. So I saw a little radio in the side of the room and I always wondered what it did there. I, I didn't know. So I, I approached my physics teacher, Keith Harris, who's also a radio amateur, and, and said, sir, what does this thing do in the corner over here? So lo and behold, he turned it on, he showed me, um, and then he let me have a little go on the air. And I registered to do what we call a foundation license. So I did that and got my license. I then got told this thing called the RSGB was free and got handed a form. So I filled that in and joined the Radio Society. And then I thought, actually, it would be really, really good to get involved because this is something that I've seen and really, really enjoy. So I joined the Training and Education Committee. But there wasn't really an awful lot I could do as a young person on there because that's all about training and education. So then um, I saw come up an application to go to Austria to go to a Yota event in 2014. So I applied and didn't get in. Um, <laughs> so then what we did is we hosted a Yota event in the UK over the course of a weekend, which I'll talk about in a second. After that, the RSGB board then said, Let's form a youth committee and really, really push young people in amateur radio. So that's exactly what they did. So I've been in office as chairman of the youth committee since 2014, right until this point. If my clicker works. So, Yota UK, we organised over a weekend back in 2014, a smaller version of the IARU event that went over in Austria. It was organised by Steve Hartley, who you've already spoken to, with some help from some young people who then, the majority of them, came on to form part of the youth committee. We did some building and also went to Baggeridge County Park to do some ARDF, where I got quite interested in ARDF. We then also had the special, events, special event station, GB1 Yota, and were assisted by the Camhams for that. 
So then November came around and that was sort of crunch time. That was when the board said the youth committee would be formed and that's exactly what happened. So we were given a brief by the board, which was what we had to do. First and foremost, we had to support the 200 odd young members that we had as part of the society. We then had to represent the hobby at radio related events. So they include things like British Science Week, Make Affairs and some of the scouting events that go on like Gilwell 24. We educate and inform young people like yourselves about amateur radio and what it is. We arrange and run events for our members, which we'll come on to in a second. We represent young people, not only within the Radio Society of Great Britain, but also within the International Amateur Radio Union, hence why we're here. We also support the regional team in going out to radio events throughout the whole of the UK to help them and help young people that maybe come to the events with their family and show them that radio is also for young people. And then finally, I like to wrap it up in three words. We inspire, we innovate, and most of all, like this event here, we achieve. So 2015 came along and the board asked us to put together a proposal to host a de-expedition. So that's exactly what we did. And we decided Wales would be a nice place to go. So we went to Wales. So Project DX15 was jointly funded by the Radio Communications Foundation and the RSGB Legacy Committee and was further sponsored by Kenwood and SOTA Awards. It was from the 23rd to the 30th of July in 2015 and organised by the RSGB Youth Committee with the support from RSGB HQ and the Camhams who are here today. So we did quite a few things at DX15. One of the things we did with the help of Steve, we built the RSGB 20 meter PSK receiver kits, which went down very, very well. We, at the time, had a call sign of Mike Charlie Zero, Romeo Yankee Charlie, and we used that to go on the air throughout the whole week. We made 4,617 contacts throughout all of the week with a station going on some days for 24 hours. We contacted 103 countries, we also took part in the IOTA contest now. For those of you who don't know, IOTA stands for Islands on the Air. And we came first place in Wales. <laughs> there is a flip side of that. We were the only station in Wales. <laughs> it's all about how you make statistics look. And we came 45th in our category. So we also did something called SOTA. Now SOTA stands for Summits on the Air. And what that involves is making antennas, climbing up a mountain, and playing with radio on the top of the mountain. I can't pronounce this word, but that was one of the mountains we climbed up throughout the week. Have we got any, yeah, Welsh at the back saying he can pronounce it, go on. Minith Klangos, thank you, yeah, thank you. Well done. So that was one of the SOTAs we activated throughout the week. The other SOTA we activated is Penavan, which was really, really good. But Penavan one of the most misleading mountains I've ever been to. So you climb up the side of Penavan and you think you're at the summit. You actually then have to climb down and up to the actual summit. Um, so that was quite knackering, but really, really good fun <laughs> nevertheless. Although the weather wasn't the best on planet Earth. We also then did some ARDF, so the participants built their own ARDF receiver antennas which involved some PVC, some tape measures that were cut up and a lot of tape and that went really well. Um, they did a DF hunt at the end. We also met some of the locals whilst in Wales. 
in 2016, we were very, very fortunate, is in the BBC, so Jim Lee, who is also a radio amateur, but works for the BBC as one of the announcers for Radio 4, said that we could come along to the BBC for a day. So we took quite a few young people to the BBC and got a tour of BBC's very own broadcasting house. And up there you see I got to present the weather, which was pretty cool. And then we got to go in and see News 24 being filmed and also viewed the London control room, among other things. So... We get to Yota 2017, where we are today. In 2015, we organised Project DX15, as I just said, and Italy hosted Yota, and that really, really inspired us. We thought, we want to do this. So I said to Steve one day, we want to organise and host Yota in the UK. And Steve said, yes, make it happen. So we did. We put together a proposal, which took a year to do, and sent it to the RSGB board, who said yes. And we also sent it to the youth working group for the International Amateur Radio Union, who also said yes. So that's what we did. So I thought it would be great, it would be easy, we'll just organise a week and we'll come here and do it. It was anything but easy. But on days like today, this is when you know that everything's come together and worked really well. So we had quite a few things we needed to weigh up and consider. First and foremost, where are we actually going to hold Yota? It's not a case of just choosing a place. We've got things to consider. We've got 26 different countries here who have come from all over the world. We've got to consider airports. Are we close to airports? How long is it going to take for them to travel? And then we also have radios. Is it a good place for radio? And all of that sort of stuff. So that was just one of the many considerations we had. We then also had to think about what people are going to do for the week. So we'll show you a little bit about what we've done for the week in a little bit. But we thought we'd organise SOTA. So going up hills and activating radios. Go to London, because nothing's more British than London, apart from fish and chips on a Friday and Bletchley Park, our very own, so that's what we did. We then had the logistics of everything, um, and that was really, really challenging to organise and quite stressful, but one of those things that has to be done in an event. We then had the special event station, which we're going to come on to in a bit. The one thing that I do have to stress is that everything here could not have been done without all of the work we had from behind the scenes. There's a fantastic picture I saw the other day of hundreds and hundreds of boxes sat at RSGBHQ in Bedford with all of the supplies, fizzy drinks and everything we had here for the week. RSGBHQ have spent days upon days upon days upon weeks upon months organising this. And if it wasn't for the likes of RSGBHQ, Steve, the commercial manager, Heather for doing the communications, Steve Thomas over there, the general manager, and everyone at RSGBHQ, as well as the Camhams, the Scouts, and everyone that's volunteered to give their time, we would not be here doing Yota today, and of course, Harris. So I'd like to give a really, really big round of applause for everyone who's helped set today up. So, as some of you may have seen, who are non-radio people here, we have quite a few antennas over there, which are transmitting radio. So, we have someone, Rob Chipperfield, from the Camhams here, who is going to talk to you a little bit about the radio setup and how all of this came together and the special event station is. So, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Rob. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. So... First of all, we've been so, so fortunate to be invited along to, to Yota 2017, not only by the RSGB, but also by the GB2GP Gilwell Park team, because the teamwork that's happened between us and them has been amazing. Most of the aerials that you can see up in uh, the sky today were put here by the, the GB2GP folks, and it's a fantastic setup. We're very, very fortunate to be here. 
as well as the location considerations that, that Mike already mentioned, how do you actually get people here from 26 countries, to be able to come here and have an OptiBeam at 80 foot, to have a tribander at 30 meters, two elements on 40 meters, this is not a typical UK station, and the help that we've had from, from the Gilwell Park folks has been amazing. So the CAMHAMs Mike, Mike mentioned a few times. It started about 10 years ago, when a few folks around Cambridge that had been chatting on a repeater decided they quite fancied taking part in VHF Field Day. They'd never done a contest before. Someone rented a port -a someone else bought a barbecue, and someone else bought a generator. And they made a few QSOs, no more than that. Since then, we've just done a little bit more. We don't do things too seriously, although hopefully we've done a fairly reasonable job at putting the station on this week. But above all, it's meant to be fun. And if it's a competition between the beer fridge, the pizza oven, the coffee maker, and a little bit more RF power, well, sometimes the pizza oven wins. <laughs> so in conjunction with the, the Gilwell Park antennas, we've provided a lot of the equipment for the insides of the station, the radios, the amplifiers, and so on. Um, and we've done that building on that 10 years of expedition experience of multiple stations. You can't just throw a few radios into a room and expect them all to play nicely. When you have six HF stations running on multiple bands at the same time, that means that you need to think about filtering. Logging, we've got about 4,500 QSOs in the log already, thanks to all of our delegates this week. But as well as making sure they all make it into the log, get the QSL cards at the end of the week, we've also been running a bit of an internal competition. There's a dashboard up in the shack. It's got, of course, the totals, how many contacts have we made, but also the breakdown of those contacts by country. A little bit of friendly competition, I might say. We haven't had any major diplomatic incidents yet, but watch this space. The Germans got off to an early start. The Finnish team weren't having that. They worked all, <laughs> the, the, they worked all through lunchtime. The Germans came back and they overtook. We had a sneaky effort by the UK team. Late night operation by Jonathan, and early morning by Will. But Finland also got up at six o'clock this morning, <laughs> determined to take back the lead. How will it end? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> We've got your eye on you. <laughs> but it's more than the QSO numbers. It's great to make a lot of QSOs. It's fantastic to have a world-class station or as close as we can manage. But what we've aimed to do when we've built GB17 Yota is actually to, to give everyone a really diverse set of experiences. A lot of folks have come here with experience maybe of HF, maybe SSB, maybe some CW. We've got folks here who are top contesters that have made their first six meter meteor scatter QSOs. People who have never heard of amateur satellites before making QSOs via SO50. Some people, it's their first pile up. A few folks, it's their first QSO. And it's been absolutely fantastic to do that. By providing the equipment and working with Gilwell Park, hopefully we've given people a taste of what you can do with amateur radio, but at the same time take something away that you can do at home. Yes, you can put on a satellite station that's fully automated, but you can also go and build your own satellite Yagi. Use that with a 10 euro SDR receiver and you can take that away. I think that the South African contingent might even have been looking for somewhere in London to go and buy not souvenirs or uh, sort of double-decker bus uh, shortbread, um, but maybe some electronics that they can take back home with them and go and receive some amateur satellites. So hopefully we can, uh, uh, we can you know, get some more folks interested in more bits of the, the hobby. Amateur radio is absolutely amazing because there's so many bits to it that if you get bored of one thing, there's a hundred more bits of the hobby that you can take part in. HF, VHF, UHF, SSB, CW data modes. The German team seem to be working through the list of all possible data modes, half of which I haven't even heard of. So there we go. QSO count, four and a half thousand so far. Where will we end the week? I think there's a, col uh, a poll going at the moment. I'm not sure. Maybe we can beat Italy last year. We'll see. Watch this space. Thanks, folks.
Rob, thank you very much. So we have participants here from all over the world. So I'm going to pass you for a minute to one of the participants. We have Philip Tremworth from South Africa. Please welcome Philip. Thank you, Mike. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philip Trenworth. My call sign is Zulu Sarah 6, Tango Romeo Echo. I am one of the team members representing the South African team at Yota this year. We have had many interesting activities uh, this week so far, including uh, intercultural evening where we got to know each other, uh, kit building, uh, station operations, and a visit to Bletchley Park. For me personally, the best activity so far has been the visit to Bletchley Park because I am a computer scientist by trade. So to see Bletchley where most of the work took place to break the Enigma codes during World War II was very special for me. I am very excited tonight to make contact with the International Space Station. Uh, I truly believe this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We've made many new friends here and it is amazing just to see so many young people interested in amateur radio. I truly believe and I hope that we can all stay in contact using the many different modes of uh, communication available to amateur amateurs and through using amateur radio. And we are in fact looking for some electronics to take back with us. You are correct. <laughs> thank you for having us and enjoy the evening. Philip, thank you. Okay, so we're getting very close to our contact with the International Space Station. We're going to show you now some videos of what we've been doing for the week so you can get a feel of what we've already done, but there is still much more to come. If you see your team and your country in the video, by all means, cheer. Enjoy. by 959 bus. We are located at Gilwell Park, just north of London, and we are uh, operating uh, the Yota station, which is youngsters on the air. My, my team is from Spain and I'm a co Alpha 5 in Yamaha Alpha. Hello, my name is Joshua Delta Charlie 7 India Alpha and I'm from Team Delta Lima. I've been operating 40 meters a bit in SSB. I'm not sure how much I did, uh, but I uh, gave my best, I think. Okay, so the kit we're building today is a brand new kit, and it's been put together by Hans Summers at QRP Labs for us. And it's a 17-meter CW transceiver, and it all sits on this one printed circuit board. 
Uh, packed with features, uh, it's not just a, a Morse transmitter receiver, it can also be used as a whisper beacon or a, a CW beacon. It's got built-in test equipment, it's got a built-in keyer. In fact, it's probably easier to say what it doesn't do than what it does do. Uh, it's a fantastic kit and uh, he'll be making these available uh, through his website but he's provided these for Yota and we're very grateful for the work he's put in. Hello, my name is Peter Barnes, M0SWN. I'm part of the uh, UK Yota team and uh, today we're building some CW transceiver kits. Uh, so uh, we just had to start by winding these toroid transformers, which is uh, a little bit fiddly, uh, and then we're on to the exciting part of soldering all the components for the kit. CV transceiver kit. It's really interesting for us. Uh, personally, I haven't done uh, something like that before. It's uh, so I've heard it's a new project, which is kind of intricate, but that makes it a lot more interesting to make as well. Um, I have done a little bit of soldering and that kind of thing at home, but not really that much. So that um, is proving to be an interesting challenge. some peanuts. Uh, this is a salted nut. It's very nice. It's, it goes down well with some boltong. Boltong is uh, also salted meat. Unfortunately, we could not bring any because of the custom rules. Um, and the, in here we've got some apricot sweets. This is also very lucky. And some Wilson toffees. This is very hard. If you bite that, it might break your teeth. And over here we've got Omo Biscuit. Now Omo, or Oma, is the Afrikaans word for grandma. So this is grandma's biscuits and as everybody knows, nobody makes better biscuits than grandma. So we've got all we've got here is Romanian traditional food and of course there's meat, there's um, uh, smoked sausage which, which is really nice, it has that deep meat scent and we've got our dessert which is salami biscuit and it's a perfect mix of coconut, cocoa and fruit jelly.
guess I'm very excited. Um, first time in England and first time in London, so there's a lot to see. Um, we are seeing Buckingham Palace and we're seeing Big Ben, Trafalgar Square, and most of those places I've seen on TV, but it's some, like some kind of myth where I'm going to finally see them as actual places where people go and do stuff. So um, I think we're all very excited about that. Also the Science Museum, which is supposed to be really good. in front of you and you turn it, you will hear loudness, but it might be that way. Send out one, two, three, four, five, they're all over the place. Oh, okay. If I can tell you one end of the numbers is that end and the other end is that end, you know, and, and, and uh, no, there's, there's no, we've just put them on the map. Right, so I've just called CQ on the 17 metre band, uh, hoping to get a contact with the GB17 Yota station. Uh, this is using the uh, new kit from uh, QRP Labs, designed by uh, Hans. Uh, and you can, well, we'll be able to see now that there is a software decoder on the screen. So uh, I can see it coming up saying uh, GB17 Yota. So I've had a contact. Uh, I'm using the Yota 17 metre ground plane antenna and uh, this new CW kit from QRP Labs. So I'll just, uh, just reply now to GB17 next, sir. Hi. I'm Luca IU2FRL from the team Yota from Italy. This morning we have just built a, a very small QRP transceiver on the 17 meters and I've built it in uh, almost uh, three hours. And uh, it was very funny because I actually uh, built a lot of uh, um, another kit or even uh, some circuit designed by me for, uh, for example, like a 1.2 gigahertz ATV transceiver a 10 GHz ATV receiver, transmitter, and even a wide FM uh, transceiver. And uh, I really like that much because uh, uh, it's a um, uh, quite easy way to learn electronics and to improve uh, your skills in soldering, in electronics in general, and even on the testing, well, uh, on the phase of the testing. So I have like a small lab to test my equipment. I'm uh, Nick G3RWF. I'm the president of the RSGB. 
So I've come along today to uh, see Yota in action, which is a great experience. I've just spent a bit of time on the air, which was a double delight. And uh, here I am next to the, the Yota key, which passes from Yota team to Yota team. And uh, things, things are going really well here. Lots of stations on the air, lots of people having a great time. Well, that, uh, that last bit saved me having to say who I am. I'm Nick G3RWF, I'm the RSGB president. Had a great time today. Just wanted to say, uh, to extend my welcome to everybody who's taking part. It's great to see you here. I'm so glad that you've come. Hope you're having a really good time. Hope the weather stays dry. And also to add my thanks to everybody who's put so much hard work into, uh, uh, into, into this event in so many ways. So that's terrific. You'll be glad to know that now you've had a welcome from the president, um, there's also been a piece of paper arrived today um, from a place you just saw uh, in the picture, which was uh, Buckingham Palace. You probably heard about it. Um, and uh, it's from our patron. And it says, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to welcome everyone who is participating in the Radio Society of Great Britain's youth event. And it's signed by Philip. Prince Philip, who of course is the Prince Consort, the husband of the Queen. So that arrived today, and uh, so Prince Philip's there thinking about you, just wishing he could be on the key as well. So. I have to say, that's, that's quite a rare treat for us, so uh, that, that's very good, very encouraging. Now it's my delight to pass over to Kieran, who is absolutely excellent at moving us to the summit of what we are here for, which is our contact. Okay, thank you very much, Nick, and hello everyone. Nice to see so many people here tonight. Um, a couple of little housekeeping rules, or a couple, a couple of little housekeeping things before we go into it. Has anybody got phones with them? Okay. Really do encourage you to take photos, but please switch it to airplane mode or uh, pl um, flight mode. Okay. I don't want any phones on uh, during the event, but please do feel free to take the pictures. The second one, any of you got radios with you? Okay. I'm going to make a request that they are switched off, okay? It's very tempting to want to listen to the Dine Link yourself. Unfortunately, um, you're going to have uh, Carlos and myself jumping on you if, if uh, we, we find it because it'll destroy the event for everybody else. So please, everybody who's got a radio on, can you switch it off? So, um, ARIS events, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. These are predominantly for educational outreach activities. So what's the educational outreach that we can do here today? It's almost like I'm preaching to the converted because we've got a lot of people who are interested in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, who are all together doing a whole host of different activities that are enjoyable and everybody gets some pleasure out of. Can somebody just shout out some of their other hobbies that they, that, that they enjoy? Sorry? Okay, anybody else? Robotics. Music, robotics, oh. art. Yeah. Anybody into woodworking, metalworking? Yeah. yeah. Okay, what, what do you, sorry? <laughs> I wish. Um, okay, what, what do you think is one of the common things between things like metalworking, woodworking, Electronics, engineering, amateur radio. Anyone? A little bit. I'm thinking of the word precision. It's a hobby, and all of those are hobbies where precision is fundamental. If you're going to make something in wood or metalwork, you've got to be precise on your measurements and everything else. If you're going to do something in radio, you've got to be precise because you play with tolerances. We all know that certain modes have got certain uh, bandwidth capabilities or, or certain um, uh, restrictions on how wide their, their signals can be. So we have to work to a level of precision. So today what I'm going to do is focus more so on what we do, what we're doing, the science and the technology behind what we do. And I'm, I'm going to take you right through the chain of the radio station itself. Uh, all the way up to the space station and possibly throw in a few other questions, uh, a few questions for you as well. So be prepared, I might pick on you. So 
First of all, I would like to introduce the rest of my team. Um, I'm Kieran, M0XTD. Uh, we've been running the uh, ARIS team in the UK here. We did the very successful Tim Peak Principia missions last year that uh, hopefully some of you saw and were uh, an outstanding success and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed doing them. Down there, I'll start at this end. On this end, we've got John. John is predominantly responsible for hauling that huge grip big trailer halfway across the country for me uh, and getting it here and helping to uh, get it set up. I've got my daughter Rebecca who's helping me here today uh, and she's on the camera and has been running around doing jobs. It is the summer holidays after all. On the mixing desk at the far end we've got Phil Crump, M0 DNY, who is um, our computer expert and our networking person. Next to him is Noel uh, Matthews, G GTZ, and Noel is very active in the, uh, the amateur television side of things, and I'll explain a bit more on that in a minute. Next to him, we've got Graham, G3VZV. Graham is uh, president of the BATC, yes. Uh, he, below, he does work with AMSAT UK and ARIS and every, lots and lots of different things. Of, a fantastic uh, ambassador for, for the, uh, the activities and the hobby. Next to Graham, we've got Frank, M0AEU. Frank is operating a mixing desk, so he's taking the feeds from uh, the cameras, from the radio, from the microphone, and hopefully from the ham TV system in Goonhilly, um, and mixing them together to create a single web stream. On the bench in front of us here, we've got Dave, uh, G4DPZ and Carlos G3VHF. He's a little bit busy at the minute because he's, <coughs> I'll come on to it, but we, we keep testing what we're doing over and over again and he's in the middle of watching a, a satellite pass uh, at the moment. So we're preparing and getting things ready. So, anybody tell me when the first satellite went up into space and what was it called? Sputnik. Who can who can tell me when it went up in space? 57. Who can tell me when Oscar 1, which is the first orbital satellite carrying amateur radio, went up into space? 1961. Good man. OK. So radio amateurs have been building satellites and launching them four years after the space race started. That sometimes just blows my mind thinking about it. It's almost as if you had um, the, anybody heard the sort of the Apple or the HP, how Apple or HP uh, originated by a couple of blokes sitting in their gardens, in their garages, building something, which was an engineering product, hobbies of that, electronics, whatever. But it's, it's just another demonstration of people doing that and that's exactly how Oscar 1 started. Some people in their garage building a, a satellite in order to get it into flight. The amazing thing was by 62 there were only two other entities who had launched things into space. And they were both governments at the time, the United States and the, uh, the USSR at the time. So we have a history of radio, amateur radios have a history of being in space for a reason. We don't just throw satellites up there for the fun of it, we do it because we're doing something. We are building something, we are testing something or what else. Now Nick and several other people have said the names and you know many of you will have come from countries where you've got your own national radio societies, the one in the UK is the Radio Society of Great Britain. Why do you think we've got radio in the title? Why, do, why is it not just communications? Anybody want to venture a guess? Yeah, <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> yeah, radio. Fundamentally, radio is communication without wires. Okay, so we are communicating without wires. Now we've all got you know, lots of internet and phones and everything else these days and um, 
uh, Wi-Fi and all that sort of stuff in our homes and houses. We can pick up our phone and we can dial somebody halfway across the world or whatever. But fundamentally, it's still radio. So there's a really good reason why we're focusing on communications without wires. So switching to the space station, um, amateur radio is a hobby. Would most of you agree with that? Yeah. yeah? So why do you think a hobby is on the International Space Station and the Mir Space Station before that and the Space Shuttle before that as well? Why do you think a hobby, what uses of a hobby do you think are there on, whoops, on, on the space station? People can learn from it. Sorry? People can learn from it. Okay, by doing what? Okay, so, but, um, so emergency communications is, is what you're talking about. But the first question, um, doing what? What, 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 do you, what do you mean by what you said? No, the first person. You can learn a lot of things by it, like when you're doing amateur radio with all the space stations, but just with space. You're experimenting, aren't you? Exactly. Yeah. So what we do is we experiment. And if you go back to your license, one of the first lines in many countries' licenses for a radio amateur is um, you are licensed to um, carry out experiments or, or, for, or experiments for self-learning purposes in radio communications. So we've got this self-learning, this self-teaching concept built into our license from the very start. Ten minutes. Okay. But it's... it's um, <laughs> thank you, Graham. Uh, so, so we're, we're, not, we're not doing this for the fun of it. We've got some really important reasons. Does anyone know any experiments that radio amateurs have been involved in, in space? No? Nope. If, if, I'm thinking even, even more fundamental than that. How about HF propagation through plasma that's been injected underneath a spacecraft? How about looking at GPS signals being received from satellites which are above the GPS orbits? These are things that radio amateurs have been involved in and have been heavily uh, in, um, influenced the work that's been done with it. Who do you think has got the most spectrum available to them? Amateur radios, or radio amateurs, or National Space Science, uh, 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 um, National Space Agencies? Yeah, radio amateurs. Amazingly, we as a hobby have got m access to more space in the radio spectrum than the whole of um, the, all of the space agencies. But as is also said, we're also an emergency lifeline. Anybody know how many radios we've got on the space station? Uh, we've got one on the Columbus, we've got on the Soyuz, we've got the ICRS, uh, and we've got also the Packet Radio, so, and we've got the HD, which is now being used for the CAPTEC rather than the mobile receiver. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we've got one radio in the service module, the Russian side of the space station. We've got one radio in Columbus, <laughs> which is the US side. Or, and we've got one radio, which I'll stretch to call it a radio. It's actually just a transmitter, which is the ham TV transmitter, which we're hoping to use um, today. So we've got all this kit on board the space station. Why have we got it all there? What, what's, what's the benefit to the space agencies for um, getting us to put that equipment there. How many of you realise that we are, the, we are actually the only non-profit, non-governmental um, agency or organisation who has the ability to schedule time in the astronauts' daily work pro um, process? And it's the daily timeline, as we call it. We're the only ones that can integrate, or the only ones that currently integrate with the, 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 uh, the science planning and everything else so that we can slot these programs in as the space station comes overhead to actually make a live contact and try and inspire you know, the younger people who are down here and try to get them to go into um, uh, STEM-based subjects and STEM-based careers 
everybody else is just to give them that extra little kick to say, keep going, there's a lot more experimenting and everything else to do. So, I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the radio contact um, itself. Uh, itself. You've, seen, you've seen us arrive yesterday, we've been busy getting things ready, we've been up, um, raising and lowering that tower a couple of times, and I think as I tweeted earlier on, we're never ready until we've actually done that at least three times, and we, uh, we kept to that rule today. Um, but that's because we're measuring, we're checking, we're double checking, we're triple checking, we're letting things sit for a little bit and then we're coming back and we're testing, we're checking. Basically, we are being ex exceptionally professional in making sure that what we've got in front of us is actually going to work. There's a, there's a saying in the satellite community, I don't know if many of you have heard it, better to have big ears than big mouths. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what that means? Correct. Basically. Okay? Receiving, listening, is actually harder than transmitting. Okay? To give you a little bit of an idea, our equipment here is going to be pushing out 250 watts into the antennas to go up to the space station. We've got 5 watts coming back from the radio on the space station. So there's going to be a number of things, that are, a number of factors that come into it that are really important. So basically, what, what we've got um, for our radio link today is uh, we're using a Kenwood TS2000 and uh, it's a radio that we've used for, for a very long time. We're familiar with it, we're happy with it, we're using Five it. Minutes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's just one thing. Um, we've got some, um, we've got a power amplifier and we've also got a rather hefty notch filter to take out all out-of-band transmissions for us so that the amateur 144 to 146 range here is as quiet as possible. Anybody spot something that we're missing? Bear outside. Who can see an SWR meter? Uh, we don't have one. And the reason is when we're testing we have in line, we have a watt meter instead, which can look at the forward power and the reflected power. And the reason we do that is that if we put a, an SWR meter in on this one, we can actually see a difference of uh, reflected power and loss of, uh, sorry, reflected power when we transmit and when we receive with the SWR meter in place. And what that does is make us a little bit more deaf on reception. So what we're trying to do is remove as much problems and as much links as we have. And of course we get to the airwaves themselves, the free space, the bit that actually gets the radio signal from here up to the, up to the space station. And that, that works on something that we, we frequently refer to as the link budget. <coughs> and uh, the best way I can describe that to you is that if I came up to your face and put a, shone a torch into your face, that would be pretty bright, wouldn't it? And pretty strong. If I walked 100 metres down the road with exactly the same torch and shone it in your direction, it wouldn't be anywhere near as powerful, would it? So, light is electromagnetic wave. It's the same stuff, stuff that we're working and playing with here, and it's all about getting that up there. The longer the distance we are away, the harder it is for us to actually get it there. So, um, Okay, so we're going to start and get ourselves ready now for the contact. I'm going to ask the uh, question askers to, to start lining up and get themselves ready, and Mike to come out to the microphone. One of the things that we do when we finish talking to the astronaut and asking questions is we like to say a really big thank you, and the way we do that is we give them a nice big cheer. So Nick is going to, at one point, step up to the microphone and basically turn around and say, thank you very much. Um, everyone wants to say... Thank you. And at that point, I want everybody to cheer. So I want to do a quick practice. OK? So on zero, I want you all to cheer and applause as much as you can. OK? Three, two, one, go. OK. I, I think you can do a bit better than that. So one more time. 
three, two, one, zero. <laughs> That'll do. Okay, so um, like I said, phones to flight mode, radios off, please. There's a reason why some of us here are watching this because we're listening to everything uh, that's going on. Okay, um, and we are going to get started. So, next, next five. One minute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1 SS, this is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1 SS, this is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1 SS, this is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1 SS. This is the Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1 SS. This is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1 SS. This is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1 SS. This is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1 SS. This is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1 SS. This is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. NA1SS, NA1SS, this is GB4 Yota. Can we go to C6, please, Palo? C6, Charlie 6. Yeah. 
November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1SS. This is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1SS, this is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. NA1SS, NA1SS, this is GB4 Yota. Paolo, we can see you on Ham TV, but we cannot hear you. If you can hear us, give us a thumbs up, please. <laughs> NA1SS, NA1SS, this is GB4 Yota. Paolo, we can hear you and we can see you on Ham TV. If you can... Uh, if you can hear us, can you please give us a thumbs up? Over. NA1SS, NA1SS, this is GB4 Yota. Palo, we can see you on Ham TV, but we cannot hear you. If you can hear us, please give us a thumbs up. Over. NA1SS, NA1SS, this is GB4 Yota. Paolo, can you go back to Charlie 2? Charlie 2, please. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1SS, this is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, NA1SS, this is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar, Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. Yes! Welcome, Paolo, to Yota 2017 in England. We have you on Ham TV. Please give us a wave. Are you ready for your first question? Over. Welcome, Paolo, to Yota 2017 in England. Are you ready for your first question? Over.
NA1SS, NA1SS is a GB4 Yota. That's good, Paolo. Thank you for the thumbs up. Uh, we ha cannot hear you on the grind at the moment. Uh, so uh, what we're going to try and do is ask some questions uh, and uh, if we can get a response on Ham TV, we will see if we can display that. Here's your first question. Good evening, this is Philip. Um, do any of you experiment with ham radio in your off time when you are not when you are not obligated to work up there? Over. One, two, three, give me a confirmation you can hear me. And one, two, three, can you hear me now? Over. Yes, we can hear you, Paolo. We are hearing you on the Ham TV downlink. One, two, three, can you hear me now? NA1SS, NA1SS, this is GB4 Yota. Yes, we can hear you, Paolo. Are you ready for your first question? Hello, hello, can you hear me now? Give me a confirmation if you can hear me now. Hello, Paolo, this is N this is GB4 Yota. Can you hear me? Over. Anyone SS? Anyone SS? This is GB4 Yota. Paolo, can you hear us? Under over. Can you hear me now? Give me a confirmation. Hello, Paolo, this is GB4 Yota. Yes, we can hear you. Over. Houston, we're all dead. Okay, Paolo, we have you on the uh, VHF uplink and we are receiving your audio on the downlink, so there will be a short delay between No, us. ricezione va benissimo. Tu mi senti? Hello, this is Philip. Do any of you experiment with ham radio? in your off time when you're not obligated to work up there. Over. strange because I think for the first time ever we have not received a downlink signal from him at all. So I'm very sorry, but we're experimenting. <laughs> so it, it's an experiment. Uh, we'll see if we can find out what's happened. Um, but at this moment, um, we can't hear him, which is incredibly unfortunate. There was a, a little bit there that uh, we got a little bit of information from him to say that he was hearing something in the headphones but we weren't hearing him. And what we were doing was actually using the Ham TV downlink, which has about a five, six second delay between him saying something and we hearing it to actually see if we can respond. But as you can see, it wasn't that particularly reliable um, as a method of doing it. So I, um, uh, I apologize. Um, this is not what we would have expected to happen at this point in time. Um, and uh, all I can say is sorry. Very sorry, but thank you very much for being here. Yep, yeah, okay. So, um, that's Amateur Radio. It is one big experiment at the end of the day, isn't it? And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. However, let's look on the flip side. 
We got him. He gave us a thumbs up. That was probably the most QRP an Italian has ever transmitted. <laughs> Stand by. If they come up and ask their questions anyway, the Irish team will have a go at answering them. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is go to, well, we did a plan A, B, C, and D, so we're going to go to plan E. Well, it's more like plan Z, but it's still a plan anyway. So if everyone comes up and asks their questions, we're going to have a member of the Aris team, although he's not Italian, he's still going to answer it. So if everyone comes up, we'll, um, we'll ask the questions that way. Hey. This is Henny. Typically, how many ham radio operators are there on the ISS? Over. Uh, typically, there are six. Sometimes there are seven. Occasionally, it drops down to uh, two or three, but generally six. Over. <laughs> Next question. Oh, the first question? Hey, you're not up here. Shush. Uh, this is Joshua. For Irish context, what frequency bands and how much power is used to communicate with the ground stations? Over. Uh, the, the answer is not enough tonight, I think. <laughs> the, the downlinks, sorry, the downlinks are normally on VHF on 2 meters, 145.8, and it depends. The transmitter you saw Paolo pl uh, trying to adjust was a, is a handheld, fairly elderly Ericsson uh, hand, uh, handy up there. It, in theory, transmits 5 watts of power. Uh, obviously, you also saw some rather dodgy, to my eyesight anyway, looking coax connections going off. And where that 5 watts is going, I'm not sure. They also have the opportunity to use the Russian segment. And they, they've got 25 watt transmitter in there. And that is normally very loud. But unfortunately, they haven't got the ham TV in the Russian segment. That's a long story. So anyway, 5 watts or 25 watts is the answer. Uh, this is Michaela. What are some of the challenges with sending live HD video from space? Over. Uh, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, it's all down to link budget. It's a question of how much power, again, is being transmitted from the space station. In that case, it's 10 watts of power. We use digital television, which is more uh, spectrum efficient. Um, the antennas are very small antennas on the outside of Columbus, and we need a fairly big dish. And you saw the dish down in Goon Hilly. It's about a 3.8 meter dish. With that sort of size dish, it works a, works a dream. And you ev even heard some audio as well this evening. So. Uh, that works okay, but it does need a quite a big dish on the ground. Over. This is Cameron. How important do you consider your interest in amateur radio to your set of technical skills? Over. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, Cameron. I don't really. <laughs> I can't answer that on behalf of us of, a, 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 of an astronaut. Uh, but they are very technical people, uh, and they they have knowledge uh, uh, and and skills over a wide area of things. So amateur radio is, is obviously one, one of them. Thank you. But not today. <laughs> this is Ruben. What would you say to encourage Yota attendees to continue with their interest in radio? Over. Uh, well, I, I, I think today just demonstrates it. We've got a lot of uh, passion here. Uh, a lot of people uh, have worked very hard to put all this together and in really, really enjoy it. Uh, and you can be an engineer, um, but you have a passion. You, you hear about artists being passionate people, um, musical or art or whatever, but actually engineers are just as passionate. So we should encourage that passion, I believe. Over. This is Girgana. How important is the amateur radio setup to ISS backup communications? Over. Thank you. That, that's a very good question as well. Um, originally, when the ISS was launched, or actually before the ISS, MIA, um, there were only direct contacts available, um, radio direct from the spacecraft to the ground, and there were very few ground stations around. In fact, in some cases, they sent ships out into the middle of the Atlantic and Pacific just so that they got radio contact directly. Now they do have uh, um, geostationary satellites uh, that they use to relay their normal communications. But sometimes those systems fail. 
and there have been, I think, three or four occasions when actually the only way of communicating with the space station or its predecessor Mir was when they picked up the amateur radio rig, and on that, on that, that those occasions, it worked. This is Jacob. How do you maintain communications with the worldwide mission control centers? Over. Well, that's a sort of follow-on question to the last one. Uh, they have three uh, uh, geostationary spacecraft called TDRIS. Uh, I, won't re I can't remember what the acronym stands for, uh, but they're geostationary, and the spacecraft of the ISS has aerials pointing up, uh, up away from the Earth to the space, to space, and then the signals are relayed down using the TDRIS system. Over. This is Susan. How many different types of communication systems does the ISS have? Over. Uh, mainly just the one that I've been talking about, the TDRIS system that communicates from the, space from the space station uh, to, to, uh, um, to geostationary orbit, uh, and then the signals come back from that. That, I believe, are the ma is the main uh, uh, system that is used, and that is used for both data and voice and phone and up and down links. So it's, it's, it's primarily just that one. And certainly the ham TV you saw tonight is the only direct uh, signal um, uh, for video downlinks that, that exist. Over. This is Luca. Can you show us your favorite trick with a water droplet? <laughs> Over. <laughs> sorry, Luca. I apologize. I would love to. You'll have to ask Paolo to do it for you. I'm sorry. I can't do this is, this is Alexander. <laughs> This is Alexandra. Do you have experienced any ionizing phenomena in space that affects the wave propagation in a positive or negative way? Over. Uh, yeah, okay, that's, a, that's an interesting one for radio amateurs. Uh, al al although we use the ionosphere at HF uh, frequencies to bounce signals off the ionosphere from the ground up and then bouncing it down off the ionosphere, in fact, at VHF and, UH and certainly at VHF, not so much at UHF and above, uh, you, you have the, the ionosphere ha provides, uh, produces what's called scintillation, which distorts the signals coming from spacecraft. Um, and that can reduce the amount of data that you can get because the data is distorted and forward error correction doesn't, doesn't do a good enough job. Uh, but there's also a lot of work being done at the moment um, w uh, 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 in relation to um, GPS signals, so navigation and timing signals, which need to be very accurate. And again, uh, coming through the ionosphere can get distorted and slowed up. Uh, so there's a lot of work, a lot of research being done at that mo about that at the moment. Okay, so the next question we probably don't need an answer for, but we're going to go for it anyway. And it's in Italian as well. <laughs> Hi, this is uh, Michele. I've got the rush question for the moment. When using amateur radio communication equipment in space, what kind of problems can cause difficulties? <laughs> and how are they actually solved? With a bigger amplifier, my friend. A bigger amplifier. Yeah, more kilowatts. Are you guys like school RP? No. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't being streamed, is it, this bit? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think the, the, the problem that we've experienced this evening, although we don't know, may well be with the, the equipment on the spacecraft, on the space station. Um, though the Ericsson is actually a replacement one for one that apparently failed some months ago. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. Right, folks. Um, you know the way you just say casually that you've been talking to Houston? Well, I have. Um, <laughs> I've been talking to the contact there who plans things. Um, we had a problem on the audio dine link. That is definite. We've had confirmation that Paolo could hear us, and we have had confirmation that the ham TV audio was actually OK. So what we are going to attempt to do, and I'm waiting on a phone call for this to come back, is that on the next pass, 2014 UTC, 2114 local, we are going to attempt it again, OK? <laughs> now, please, please remember, Please remember, I'm waiting on a phone call. This is a decision of the flight director in NASA's uh, ISS mission control room. So I'm waiting on a confirmation of that call, but we're going to try it again. So can I suggest that uh, we take a break and you guys assemble. Uh, I'll either get the message out that it's not happening, or you guys assemble around 10 to 9 local time, 
and we'll see what we can do, okay? It's going to be a slightly different contact. There's going to be lots of pauses. We're probably not going to get as many questions as we want to get done, answered, because of the inherent delay on the, the digital uh, video side of things and the digital audio side of things. But let's at least see if we can try it as an experiment, okay? Okay, all of you that are here with Yota still say sat down. Um, we're just going to sort of sort out the logistics of this. So hopefully by the time Kieran gets an answer.
Major Tom to ground control. Can we all listen by, please? Okay, so um, welcome again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For the first time in history, this is an unprecedented second contact. So what I would like to say on a serious note just before we do this, um, there is no other way we can pour our hearts out to Aris for what they've done. I don't think ever, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kieran, I don't think ever in history have Houston turned around and gone, yep, it's fine, we'll do a second contact in an hour. This is the first time for the UK. This is the first time for the UK. Um, and yeah, we, we can only thank Aris. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so just before we start, um, we would like to show you a little video. So, Steve, just take a take a look. Okay, give us a wave from that side. That way, go. Up, wave, that go that way. Come on. Hello. That way. That way. Back again. Go. That way again. South Africans. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Yeah. I can't hear you. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay, one last time. I'll pass it over to Kieran. Kieran, thank you. Okay, okay thanks. <laughs> not again tonight. Yeah, no, no, it's not going to be possible again later on. Um, right. Welcome back, folks. Um, like I said, apologies beforehand. We believe we've got a problem with uh, uh, the radio in uh, the Columbus module, so we're actually switching to the service module. I was talking earlier about having two different systems, uh, so it's an experiment. So we're switching to the, uh, to the Russian service module segment, and we're going to reattempt the contact. Uh, it is going to be voice only. We are not going to have the uh, ham video. Uh, but that's okay, uh, because this is, uh, this is real-time sort of communication with the flight director going through the HAM uh, TV um, uh, coordinator in Houston who's organised this for us. So uh, if you're on the web stream, Kenneth, I'd just like to uh, say a huge thank you to you. And I would also like to say a huge thank you to our Russian counterparts who have uh, allowed us to go into the service module as well. Thank you very much, Sergei. <laughs> OK, so we're going to reattempt this again. We're going to do it by voice. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to start off, so I'm going to make the contact with Paolo and just basically uh, thank him for, for doing it. And then we're going to get straight into Mike uh, going with the uh, the welcome to the GV4 Yota, uh, and then we're going to get going on the questions. So, question askers, can I have you uh, lined up and ready in uh, just a few minutes, please? Um, we've we've got we've got about uh, yeah about ten minutes. So, um, any questions, anybody? Does anybody want to ask anything about what happened earlier? And I'll see if I can answer it, but try to put it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're on the radio. There's no <laughs> um, anybody got any questions? Just trying to tie it. What happened? What happened? What happened? Okay, what happened was um, uh, <laughs> okay. Carl, Carlos. Sometimes Carlos tries to keep the tension down between him and me, and you'll hear a little bit of outbursts from him now and again, and uh, and and I will generally descend into to giggles and. Uh, but this is the way we deal with it. It's, uh, th these contacts are uh, pressured when you're running up to them. And uh, we, have a, we have a very strong team here in the UK who are 
very capable of working these team of these contacts, and we we have a real seriously good laugh uh, doing them. So. Uh, First of all, I'm going to say thank you very much to my team because without them I couldn't do anything. So I would like everybody to say thank you very much to, to the whole of the ARIS team. Okay, so, so what happened? Okay, so we were calling. Um, we knew our station was working well because in the few minutes when Graham was shouting 10 minutes, 5 minutes, Carlos was actually listening to a satellite that was doing a pass over, overhead where it was transmitting 30 milliwatts. Now the space station transmits five, five watts from the, the Ericsson radio. We were hearing it perfectly clear. <coughs> We've just done a test between our station here in uh, England and a station in Holland. Uh, so Wouter, so I'm going to say a big thank you to Wouter as well who uh, is helping us out here as well today over in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. <laughs> Routers PA3WEG, but what we've just done is we've just made it. We've just made a direct voice link by pointing our, our directional antennas at each other. So we've confirmed that our radio stations are hearing each other, and we can transmit as well. Uh, what seems to have happened, and what seems to be indicated, is that you you saw Paolo sort of pointing to this, um, and you could see him talk, but we weren't hearing anything. So we suspect there's something gone wrong with the transmission path from the radio to the antenna. So it's something that we, ARIS, are going to have to diagnose. We're going to have to put work together, procedures together, to actually start diagnosing what's the issue. We're going to have to schedule that into the astronauts' timeline. Again, this is just something we do with the cooperation of the space agencies. Um, the NASA flight director has been incredibly kind to us tonight. Um, so it's a big thank you to NASA to allow us to do this flight, uh, to do this contact again. Uh, but a big thank you as well to Paolo, because he's having to float all the way down from one end of the station to the other end to actually speak to us. And uh, so wh when we have that round of thanks and applause at the end, I think we can make it extra, extra loud uh, for him. So the, the, the issue is that we think we've got <coughs> some technical problems. We're amateurs. We're going to get together, we're going to uh, get the right people looking at it, we're going to put the procedures together, we're going to send up some test procedures to the astronauts. When we can fit it into their timeline, we'll test it out. But for now, we are simply going to revert to the service module and we will work with our Russian colleagues and we will pull the whole thing together so that we can do contacts. Unfortunately, we won't have ham TV for the moment, uh, but we will at least be able to hear the astronaut. The difference this time is that from the service module, we're producing an awful lot more than five watts. So this should be a very nice, loud signal. It's a lower elevation pass for us. So the last pass was an 84 degree pass. Uh, this one is a 31 degree pass. So um, time-wise, I think we're pretty much about the same or just under 10 minutes. So I'm hoping we should be able to, to get things. Seven minutes. OK, so we, we've got definitely got shorter time. So we'll work on trying to get as many questions. So to the question askers, please you know, remember what I said. It's about being quick, punctual, getting the questions right, keeping a watch on me whenever, uh, when we're working the, the, the queue through. And let's see if we can get all the questions asked. So that's the long and short of it. There was a problem. We've overcome it. We worked in real time between myself, uh, Kenneth in uh, Houston, and Kenneth was working with the flight directors, and we attempted to find out if we could, excuse me, um, work with Paolo to find out if he would be prepared to do it again. He very kindly has said yes. We're grateful to him, and uh, I think we can, we can definitely let him know that we are we're grateful for this second shot. Um, this is the first time in the UK that we've ever had what I would call a failure on a contact but also the first time that we're doing it on the next orbit. We've done that elsewhere in ARIS around the world. It's happened several times, but this is really, really special, um, and it takes a lot of rapid work by people uh, in a lot of different places to make it happen. So um, long and short, like I said, there was a problem on the radio, but hey, it's an experiment. We're going to carry on and adapt, change, do something different to see if we can get our contact to work, and then we're going to move on. We're going to figure out what the problem was. We're going to 
fix it, and we'll get things back running again. That's it. So, anything else? Thank you. Okay, so anybody else got a question? Yep. Uh, why isn't there more amateur radio gear on the space stations, such as backup transceivers or more equipment? Okay. I, I was alluding to you to earlier that why why do the why 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 is amateur radio, which is basically a hobby, why is it on the station? And one of the answers was emergency communications. So we act as an emergency communication system to all of NASA's systems. We, when, we do, when we schedule these contacts, we are not using any of the, the space agency infrastructure anywhere in the world. We're just using our own. But we form an important link and a function back to the space agency. But the space station is a very limited volume. So it, you have to be very careful in terms of what you put up there how much it is, um, and of course you've got to then get it up there in the first place. Um, if anybody has taken part in doing any um, any work like CubeSats or whatever, or taken part in, in trying to find launches for CubeSats, you'll know exactly that the biggest cost is getting it up there in the first place. So we have one radio, and that's it. Now what Aris is doing, is we are replacing that radio. Uh, we've, we are hoping to replace that radio um, with a new radio and a new power supply as well, which will give us a little bit more um, uh, reliability, if you like. But it's a process where you have to get everything right. You know, this is this is where we complain about paperwork all along, but this is something that is really critical. The radio has to be right. The radio mustn't generate too much heat, because don't forget, there's no natural convection up there. Any, any heat generator is going to get dissipated. It's going to warm up the, air, the environment for the, for the astronauts. So there's a whole host of things that we do to make sure that everything is, uh, is, is, is getting into the, the location that we want it to be. And so our backup, actually, is the service module. The service module's backup is us in the Columbus module. That's the best way I can put it. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yep. When's your next ARIS contact in the UK after tonight? Um, Ar um, ARIS works on a regional basis. So we've got five regional bases around the world. Um, there's North America, there's um, Canada and South America, there's uh, Europe, and there's um, Asia or Japan, um, ARIS Japan, I should say and there's Aris Russia. Um, we have, as you can imagine, we have a limited number of opportunities. So the Aris operations team work to actually put all of these options together. The latest round of applications for Aris Europe has indicated that there may well be one school contact in the UK next year, sometime between January and June. We don't know when, we're still in this planning phase, we've still got lots of work to do about it. Um, but we generally look at, Tim Peake was, a, was an extra special one, we did 10 contacts in 19 weeks, which was phenomenal, but uh, next one we think in the UK will be sometime next year. Okay, right, so I'm going to start and uh, see if I can call Paolo, and uh, like I said, um, let's see if we can get this, uh, let's get this working. Hmm? Two in?
November Alpha 1, Sierra, Sierra. November Alpha 1, Sierra, Sierra. This is Golf Bravo for Yota. S listening and standing by for a contact with the International Space Station. Over. NA-1SS, NA-1SS, this is Golf Bravo 4, Yankee Oscar Tango Alpha, GB4 Yota, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. Golf Bravo 4, uh, Yankee Oscar Tango Alpha, this is November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, this is Golf Bravo 4, Yota. Hello, thank you very much for uh, helping us to do a second attempt on this. This is Kieran from the UK operations team with Aris. Um, are you ready for your first question so that we can schedule uh, the, uh, the, stu the, the questioners? Over. Yes, I'm ready. I hear you loud and clear. And uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize for uh, before. I don't know what happened there. And that's part of the experimentation that we do up here. But go ahead with the questions. Over. Welcome, Paolo, to Yota 2017 in England again. Are you ready for your first question? Over. That's a firm. Uh, I'm ready for the questions. Go ahead. Over. Hello, Paolo. This is Philip. Uh, do any of you experiment with ham radio in your free time when you're not obligated to work up there? Over. And Philip, uh, it depends. Uh, some of the people, uh, some of us up here really like uh, ham radio and really spend time uh, some other less. Uh, in general, uh, uh, we do spend a little bit of time with ham radio fooling around and trying to, to contact a lot of people in the world. Over. This is Henny. Typically, how many ham radio operators are there on the ISS? Over. Henny, uh, usually all of us uh, have a ham radio license, uh, but, but, but few of us uh, are uh, really really, really um, using it, uh, so it, that occasionally, let's say, uh, w once every couple of crews you get uh, somebody who's really into it and stays all the time on the radio, over. This is Joshua for Eris Contacts. What frequency bands and how much power is used to communicate with the ground stations, over. Well, uh, here on the station we have two radios. Uh, one that I used before that is probably not working really well, and then we have uh, a Kenwood uh, uh, in uh, FM dual bander, and uh, sorry, standard two meters, and it's a standard five watt uh, power. But we are really over you, so it's, uh, you can hear us well. Over. Hello, this is Michaela. What are some of the challenges with sending live HD video from space? Over. Hi, Michaela. You, you saw before uh, that not all these things work, and uh, one of the problems is that uh, we are traveling all over the world really fast, and uh, all the bands and frequency change, and the regulations are different around the world, and I think that's a real good challenge. We need to make sure that the world is unique, and, uh, and everybody uses the same thing if we want to go forward. Over. This is Cameron. How important do you consider your interest in amateur radio to your set of technical skills? Over. Well, I think it's uh, it's very important. I I was uh, really into it when I was uh, younger. One of my friends, uh, uh, one of my tutor had uh, ham radio, and and I think through that I I really refined my uh, technical skills. So ham radio helped me in uh, building my future. Over. This is Ruben. What would you say to encourage Yota attendees to continue with their interest in radio? Over. And Ruben, this is uh, also something that I said before. I mean, uh, ham radio, it's, uh, it's a good way to meet people that are enthusiastic when they do things. It's a good way to learn about technical things. And it's a good, uh, it's a good way to discover what, what is around you. So I would encourage people to keep doing it. Over. This is Gilgana. How important is the amateur radio setup to ISS backup communications? Over. Well, you gotta, if the, the ham radio is uh, planned to be used in case of emergency. And now, this day we have very many satellites and way of communicating, so it's less important in a certain way. But it was very important until uh, 10 or 15 years ago, where essentially that was the only way to communicate, and it happened several times. Over. 
This is Jacob. How do you maintain communications with the worldwide mission control centers? Over. Yes, and uh, we do have a satellite uh, link uh, that uh, allow us to talk over six or five different channels. Uh, so we can have uh, different communication going uh, at uh, any different time, and uh, and so we use those uh, those uh, satellites. But it's it's really difficult because we are rotating around the Earth very fast. So you have to have at least three or four satellites to cover to to cover you for uh, an hour and a half over. This is Susan. How many different types of communication systems does the ISS have? Over. And Susan, we have uh, voice, we have uh, video, we have uh, five channels of uh, voice, or four channels of voice, we have six uh, video channels, and, uh, and of course we have a way to exchange uh, data, command and control data with uh, ground control. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have a way to have uh, internet data up all the way up here, over. This is Luca. Can you show us your favorite trick with a water droplet? Over. <laughs> well, Luca, I would have showed it to you if I would have video, and I'm doing it right now. So you can try to drink something upside down. Put yourself upside down and drink something. That's already a nice trick. Over. This is Alexandra. Do you experience any ionizing phenomena in space that affects the wave propagation in a positive or negative way? Over. Well, Alexandra, this, uh, yes, we do this kind, we have this kind of uh, ionizing phenomena, especially the sun is uh, working there, so there are days where things uh, seem not to work uh, uh, very well, and of course our computer cameras and everything show all these ionizing uh, problems, over. This is Michele. When using amateur radio communication equipment in space, what kind of problems can cause difficulties? How are they solved? Over. And Michele, yes, uh, well, uh, radio communication, uh, the, the, we have a little bit of problems because of interference uh, up here and then uh, the location of the antennas and then the irradiated field. So those are more or less the same problems that people have on the ground when they have many stations all uh, placed together. And we need to be careful in not uh, on avoiding interference. And uh, this is done uh, through carefully planning and through carefully design. Over. Hi, Paolo. This is Nick. I'm president of the Radio Society of Great Britain. I want to thank you on behalf of all of us for talking to us tonight. It's been really great. And I'm going to ask everybody here to show their appreciation in a big way. <laughs> NA1SS, this is GB4 Yota wishing you a very successful mission on the ISS. Hands him back to NA1SS for any final. 73, GB4 Yota, off and clear. Yes, and Nick, uh, and to all the people of Yota, uh, thank you for uh, your patience in, uh, in um, waiting for this uh, call. It's my pleasure to be able to talk to you. Uh, I think you, you are... Uh, uh, doing something that uh, is important and interesting for you, so if this is your passion, uh, keep doing it. It's uh, very nice, very interesting, and at the end, uh, uh, it brings you whatever you, it needs to bring. So thank you again for, uh, for being there, uh, for, uh, for listening to me, and uh, looking forward to see everybody's face in the future. NA1SS, NA1SS, this is GB4 Yota. Thank you, Paolo, from the UK IRS operations team, and uh, many thanks for your efforts tonight, as well as everybody else on the ground. GB1, GB4 Yota, off and clear. And thank you to you, November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, uh, off and clear. Bye bye. Okay, we did it. It was unconventional, but it's going to make a little bit of memory for Yota 2017. Thank you very much for coming back. I hope you enjoyed it. We got to hear him. We got some of the questions answered. Um, like I said, a huge thanks to my team, because without them, I couldn't do any of this at all. Um, and a huge thanks to the whole of the ARIS uh, organization for actually giving us this opportunity to do this. Thank you very much, everyone, and good night.
okay. So, they do say third time lucky, but we were second time lucky, so it's all good. Um, I will just say once more, Kieran and all of the team have put a tremendous, tremendous amount of work into making this work for us here at Yota. Hopefully this is an experience that all of the people that ask questions and indeed myself will remember for the rest of their lives. Once more, please give it up for Kieran and the Eris team. Okay, so um, the Germans have just told me to tell you that... If